Hello everyone, this is Lauren Deeg, I'm an Associate Professor of Urban Planning, coming to you today from the, uh, the Urban Planning uh, Department office. Today we're going to be talking a little bit more about Unit 5, Phase 3, A Haven of Rest. We're looking at some concepts and precedents for placemaking, different parks, different structures, different walks, whether it be canopy walks or river walks, garden follies, pavilions, jetties, belvederes, and promontories as good vocabulary and good typologies for us to look at as we look move forward with our project, a space for social distancing. We start with uh, Confluence Park in San Antonio, Texas. This is by Rialto Studio in Lake Flato. Lake Flato uh, Architects has a great relationship with Ball State. Uh, I encourage you to uh, keep them in mind. They have won AIA firm of the year several years in the past decade and are a great place to work. And uh, San Antonio is a great place to Great place to live. It's one of our more interesting cities uh, with, with great projects like the, the, the San Antonio River Walk, uh, which is just upriver from here. But this confluence park here is just a wedge of land kind of left over in the city grid. You can see it's next to a couple of neighborhoods. But this partnership between this landscape architecture firm and architecture firm, the development of this pavilion and the development of this park, uh, for, that it really does serve these two neighborhoods and create some interesting access points into the San Antonio River. It's a very interesting project. That came about in the last uh, couple of years. Wonderful, wonderful example of, of a, the sculptural qualities of concrete. Uh, this is a very difficult shape, as you might imagine. This is very uh, uh, reminiscent, perhaps, of Gothic vaults in, uh, in uh, medieval cathedral architecture, uh, perhaps even some references to some Islamic architecture uh, in terms of um, spaces and vaults and proportions uh, and the like, but uh, it's something that you can see that kids really gravitate to. Some wonderful tie-ins with uh, uh, the native plants and uh, natural landscape of, of South Texas, uh, as as you look at this portion of the river, of the riverbanks. Interesting uh, connections and bridges and other elements uh, between this pavilion and uh, and some of the other natural elements of the landscape. Some great details from Rialto Studio. Interesting paving details, drainage details, native plants, some core tent steel, some concrete. Some great details here in terms of how they deal with uh, capturing uh, water runoff and, uh, and and sheltering that uh, and, and supporting that with native plants, creating an interesting approach to the pavilion itself, uh, how that almost emerges almost out of the, out of the landscape there. So really great great project, great partnership between this architecture firm and the this landscape architecture firm. Take a look at how the, the light just kind of casts these wonderful shadows onto the ground and how that starts to really engage kids here uh, and how that, that sort of allows fresh air to, to pass through um, and, and drain and drain effectively as well. Great project down there in South Texas. Other smaller projects uh, closer to home. Uh, the, the Cranbrook Institute is a school of architecture and a boarding school just outside of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, it's on the former Dodge estate um, uh, from the Dodge Brothers uh, and it has it has houses a great school of architecture as well as a school of art. Uh, as well as um, as well as a residential school for uh, younger younger students, um, Cranbrook was uh, campus was designed by um, uh, the, the elder Eliel Sarin, uh, who is an architect from Finland, who came to the United States. You may be familiar with uh, Eliel Sarin and his son Eero Sarin, and uh, did a good portion of work in Columbus, Indiana. For those of you familiar with Columbus, Indiana. At any rate, uh, the master's level students who work at the, uh, who study at the School of Architecture have, have constructed a few pavilions on the campus um, uh, for folks to enjoy. As you can see, that is winter. We do have winter in Michigan. Um, a, great, a great contrast uh, there with the landscape in terms of how, uh, how the snow contrasts with other, other natural colors. But a uh, great collection here of concrete, uh, some steel uh, details, some timber details, some, some cedar shakes. Uh, interesting composition here, primarily of uh, what appear to be either low-grade telephone poles or, or uh, felt timber, um, and other uh, connections with galvanized metal and, and concrete. But uh, an interesting uh, series of design-build projects there at the Cranbrook Institute, uh, where students have left left their mark literally on uh, portions of the campus. A newer project that just opened last summer in Midland, Michigan. This is very close to where I grew up. Uh, I grew up in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Uh, Midland is about 22 miles away. Uh, They're on the east central portion of, of lower Michigan. Uh, this is a forest canopy walk, a newer sort of building type or building typology. 
uh, in landscape architecture and architecture. Uh, this is by Metcalf Associates. Uh, this is portion of, of sort of the cultural campus of Midland, Michigan. Uh, the original Grace, uh, Grace and Herbert Dow Estate is here, now known as the Whiting Forest of Dow Gardens. The Alden B. Dow Home and Studio. Alden B. Dow was the son of Herbert Dow, the founder of Dow Chemical. Alton B. Dow is, uh, became an architect and, and built over 200 buildings across the state of Michigan uh, in his long tenure as an architect in Michigan. Uh, their two estates have, are now known as Dow Gardens. Uh, they, are, they serve as botanic gardens and conservancies uh, and, and are visitable uh, by, by several folks, um, right a contingent next to their uh, Civic Center for the Arts as well as their city libraries. So that all leads as one campus uh, together. Uh, this new um, it, it's worth noting that the Alden B. Dow home is, is available for tours. Alden B. Dow is a graduate of Columbia University as well as the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture at Taliesin. Spent a little bit of time with Frank Lloyd Wright in the beginning of the 20th century. And then came back to Midland uh, and absorbed a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright's principles and brought into uh, his architecture and his landscapes. This Forest canopy, though, is an interesting addition to the gardens. You can see it snakes through and connects uh, several portions of the gardens. Uh, it is the largest forest canopy in North America, uh, notably. And so we, we hope uh, all of you will get a chance to visit it sometime. Uh, it's just a short drive, about, about five hours north of Muncie. And uh, for those of you heading through Michigan or to Michigan, uh, do, do stop and take a look at this forest canopy when it reopens after COVID. Uh, has several features integrated into it, several overlooks, several several opportunities to interact with the landscape, look down, uh, interact with art, interact with um, uh, with each other, interact with the lower levels and upper levels. So some very interesting little stops and features as part of this very large project of the Forest Canopy Walk. Another treetop walkway found at Kew Gardens in London. This is by Mark Sparfield Architects. Kew Gardens are the Royal Botanic Gardens, which was portions of the Royal Summer Palace grounds, which are just west of London. Uh, they, uh, uh, this is all reachable by train or by tube. And so these would, be, would have been the summer palaces for the British Royal Family, now known as the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. You can see uh, the temperate house and the tropical house uh, holding several exotic plants. This treetop walkway is just very close to the temperate house, which uh, holds several plants. A very interesting imposing uh, piece of architecture is another example of a treetop walkway. You can see the temperate house in the background. Interesting collection of timber, corten steel, uh, stainless steel, aluminum. Very imposing, as I said, tower element that brings you up to the forest canopy level, allows you to interact with the trees and with birds and other wildlife at their level. Also, there's an interesting elevator uh, attached to the side there. It's, uh, it shares a space with uh, something called the rhizomerium. It's actually a, a dugout uh, portion of the landscape here that allows you to learn about rhizomes and root systems and things of that nature. So a lot of educational things built into the Royal Britannic Gardens of Kew. Back to Texas. This is a project that is underway right now by the firm of Catherine Gustafson, Jennifer Guthrie, and Shannon Nickel, also known as GGN. Catherine Gustafson, Guthrie, and Nickel is a firm that uh, you may know from their work at Millennium Park in Chicago. They are the landscape architects for the Lurie Garden, which is a major portion of the, of the uh, Millennium Park. So this is a project that's underway. Not much there at the moment. <laughs> a little bit of uh, frontage there on the Colorado River in this portion of Austin, Texas. Development sketches, printing out, just printing out uh, the aerial and taking colored pencils and starting to sketch out ideas on top of that. Great examples of, of process work and of design work. All found on their social media. If you want to look, learn more about this friend, go to GGN Images on Instagram. And then a series of pencil sketches that start to develop ideas for components, for areas, for social areas, for uh, 
educational areas. Look, take a look at some of the pencil techniques here uh, involving, involving shelters and pavilions uh, and social areas, play areas, as well as the trees. These fast development sketches can be done just on trace paper or regular paper and really started to, to advance some of the ideas of the project. It's good to take a look at their techniques and see how they use fast spent, uh, pencil sketches to, to advance their ideas. Later on, more, a more advanced Prismacolor color pencil sketch. You can see the wonderful layering and blending of different colors coming together with these careful yet still very loose uh, sketches showing how these different park areas and park pavilions could, could address the native landscape as well as um, other trails and uh, meadows and orchards. Some great, great color pencil work here by the staff of Guthrie Custinson and Nicole. The Serpentine Pavilions uh, are a group of, or I should say, it is a, a common site, but they, they build a different pavilion every year. It's a temporary piece of architecture that we, that we either call a pavilion or in some cases a garden folly or a folly. A folly is a piece of architecture that, that has no um, function beyond shelter or beyond uh, the ability to read it in a landscape. It's sort of a tradition uh, of a garden folly is a shelter that is often found in royal gardens uh, or in formal gardens like uh, this portion of Hyde Park. Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens are just west of Buckingham Palace in, in London. We can see some different features here. The Albert Memorial, Royal Albert Hall, where many of your favorite bands have played in London. Uh, a wonderful uh, fountain by a uh, memorial of, of Princess Diana, which is also by Catherine Gustafson, Catherine Nichol. And the Serpentine Gallery, which is a small art gallery, it's part of the gardens. The Serpentine Pavilion is a temporary structure installed very close to the Serpentine Gallery, and they change uh, they change it out every single year. So every year, a new architect is selected uh, to design and construct the Serpentine Pavilion. Hyde Park is a beautiful part of London. Uh, I, I was there just a few years ago, very close to uh, the setting sun, so you can see a lot of families out enjoying uh, this portion of the park. It's called the Serpentine gallery in the Serpentine Pavilion because it's very close to the Serpentine Lake, uh, which is an inland lake or inland pond in the middle of Hyde Park. You can see people enjoying uh, uh, a cafe and um, uh, paddle boats here on the Serpentine itself. So that's why it's called the Serpentine. Uh, this particular pavilion is from 2013. The architect was Su Fujimoto out of uh, Japan and uh, uh, very interesting pavilion primarily, again, constructed entirely of tube steel uh, as sort of a, a space frame project and was quite quite uh, memorable, um, quite quite an impressive project and quite an impressive structure uh, both day and, in, and at night. You can see the Serpentine Gallery uh, building right behind it in these photos. Uh, this photograph is interesting because it does show people climbing into the structure, which is interesting because that was not allowed whatsoever when I visited. <laughs> Concept sketch, a uh, red pencil on trace paper or regular paper. The model. Uh, depiction or, or concept of the model, probably a model here with mesh, and a few model uh, trees and, and model people, which is interesting again because we, we see people climbing on the pavilion itself or climbing on it, which uh, unfortunately was not allowed when I was there. Uh, larger scale model, here is, here's the staff of, uh, of the architecture firm Suji, so Fujimoto out of Japan. You can see them starting to number and index all of the different pieces and parts that would go into the building itself upon construction. I was there very close to sunset. I think this was the year 2013. Yes, it had been summer of 2013 very close to sunset there in Hyde Park, and I'm watching the sunset behind the pavilion. And continue to watch folks interact with the pavilion and photograph it. This is well into the era of Instagram, so Instagram is, is a very Instagram of the space, if you will. And some of the more interesting photos that I was able to take, not, not just involving the sunset, but also how the pavilion just kind of disappeared into the air. So as we look at 
all the different things we've studied this semester in positive and negative space, this project was really one that, that truly blurred the lines between positive and negative space, just in terms of how uh, this pavilion literally disappears into the air or into its site. Then watching the sunset uh, behind the pavilion, this gentleman right here, his job was to keep people away uh, and keep people from climbing on the pavilion. That was his only job. And so uh, despite my efforts to try to uh, climb the pavilion or sit on one of the suitable areas, uh, it was definitely that gentleman's job to keep people away from the pavilion itself. Uh, some danger in terms of the delicateness of the structure uh, made it necessary to keep people from uh, sitting or, or climbing the pavilion itself. Another interesting project out of Finland, this is by a British firm called Neon, uh, called the Shiver House. Um, Shiver House is an attempt to address a traditional Finnish garden structure, uh, but this is very delicate, very delicate veneer, like thin, thin strips of wood that react to the wind. So each time a gust of wind or a brush of wind comes by, uh, the entire pavilion moves. To Chicago, the Chicago Riverwalk um, evolved over a series of phases, a great partnership between Ross Barney Jankowski as well as uh, uh, associates from uh, Suzaki's uh, Associates Landscape Architects. Uh, the lead project um, landscape architect for Suzaki later on uh, turned, uh, turned and, and formed her own firm called Agency Landscape and Planning. Her name is Gina Ford. She has uh, uh, given a lecture here at CAP and uh, her, her entire talk is available on our uh, CAP Guest Lectures YouTube channel. Uh, Carol Ross Barney has also given a talk here at CAP. Uh, she, she gives a wonderful talk about memorial design and memorials, the impact of memorials in the city. Uh, I believe her talk is also available on our CAP Guest Lectures YouTube channel. The Riverwalk, as I mentioned, started with uh, uh, some very early phases uh, partnership between Suzaki and Ross Barney Jankowski, starting with the Chicago Vietnam Memorial over here on the eastern portion of the Riverwalk. From there, the subsequent phases, um, they decided, I think rather wisely, to consider each one of these portions of the Riverwalk as a different outdoor room bounded by uh, the bridges that are so synonymous with Chicago. Michigan Avenue uh, Bridge, State Street Bridge, Dearborn Bridge, uh, Wells Street Bridge, LaSalle, uh, all of the bridges that, that define this portion of the Chicago River, and then started to think about each one of these as a separate theme that would be the driving force behind the design uh, of each portion of this river walk. Of course, someone walking uh, through here, with, it all kind of ties together. So subsequent, subsequently to that, every single one of these outdoor rooms carries with it a different really activating uh, the two levels of Wacker Drive. Upper Wacker Drive, Lower Wacker Drive, tucked in behind this, and then uh, newer restaurants, breweries, uh, wineries, coffee shops, uh, uh, and other social spaces uh, 
tucked in here in this portion of lower Wacker Drive, which actually traffic runs right below it. So as some of you who know Chicago know that uh, upper and lower Wacker Drive are separated traffic, through traffic goes through underneath, local traffic on top, uh, and then tucking in these new uh, facilities, services, uh, and retail establishments that uh, allow folks to really enjoy the river walk at the river level. Different types of seating, different types of lighting, different types of paving, different types of hookups and features. Uh, the kayaking has really become quite big on the Chicago River. Uh, here's here's pe someone probably leading a kayak tour. Uh, other, other portions uh, involving native plants, uh, as well as riparian vegetation that uh, really holds down, holds together the soil and uh, contains, uh, contains runoff in an interesting way. Great example here in the Chicago Riverwalk of a promontory. A promontory is a raised mass of land that projects into a lowland or a body of water. So we have a couple of really small but really effective uh, examples here of promontory, where that an extension of the land into a body of water or over a view. So these are great examples uh, of, of, of a terminology that we use in architecture, landscape architecture, and planning, the, the idea of a promontory. We can also see uh, these floating beds here. These are, these are intended to help clean runoff or clean the river water. Uh, some interesting examples of riparian vegetation there. Being installed as raised beds as well. So each one of these promontories along the Chicago River Walk uh, becomes an, another opportunity for gathering or for, for activities, or in this case, street bending. Other smaller promontories uh, above these raised beds, you can see these river beds here. These are great installations of, of, uh, of plants that are helping to clean runoff and, uh, and respond or clean to the river water. You can see some interesting details here with these two folks. Uh, leaning on these benches, these are these are technically sitable spaces, right? But they are not necessarily seats. They are more leaning um, kinds of railings. But you can see there's two levels here to uh, obviously protect somebody from falling uh, directly into the water. Uh, but they become uh, a type of bench that becomes something that you can lean against. Some of their drawings, we can see uh, these these great computer uh, generated. Uh, models either either with some 3D modeling software or in or with Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. Uh, those relationships between uh, between the different planting beds, uh, the promontories, uh, the the portions of the docks. These are very large bollards here that the, that the planting beds slide up and down. Uh, you can also probably tie up a boat next to those too, but they also protect uh, the planting beds from boat traffic uh, from colliding into them. So you can see these. Uh, these bollards here are, are uh, interacting and, and uh, supporting and protecting the promontories as well as the raised beds. Here we are on the infamous, famous Chicago Architectural Boat Tour uh, going by that particular site at night. Interesting lighting uh, detail uh, embedded into each of the promontories creates a wonderful glowing effect at night. Um, all, of the, all of the Chicago River Walk is available uh, to the public well into the evening hours and is patrolled uh, by security. Uh, uh, interesting lighting elements here, uh, interesting lighting details embedded into the staircases and the seating elements. Larger lighting uh, installation here uh, actually projects, uh, uh, projects images onto the side of the merchandise mart, so that is another interesting feature. Uh, this larger the theater room, if you will, the amphitheater, where this acts as an entire amphitheater. Really great detail here of integrating an ADA accessible ramp into that staircase, and we, uh, we effectively tested that with students of, uh, last year, but you can see again these strips of lighting that are embedded into, into the design uh, really make for some interesting dramatic evening landscapes. Here's the Chicago uh, Vietnam Memorial, which was the first phase of the Riverwalk project as a partnership between Suzaki uh, Associates Landscape Architects and Ross Barney Jankowski Architects. Uh, really a very, very solemn and very important uh, uh, memorial space uh, here along the Riverwalk, making reference to different elements, uh, the, the, the service medal, the service ribbon, all of the names of Chicago uh, Vietnam veterans who 
who are killed in action or missing in action. Interesting uh, references to falling water and running water and the sounds of, that that makes, as well as making interesting connections back to the river water itself. Uh, so a very, very small but very uh, important and very solemn uh, sacred space uh, as, a, as a memorial to fallen veterans uh, here on the Chicago. Other pieces of architecture have emerged. The new Apple Store by Foster and Partners is now part of the Riverwalk. Some really wonderful details there. If you haven't been there, I do recommend visiting some fantastic architectural details and interior design details. And again, as I mentioned, uh, the project, projected image uh, onto the Merchandise Mart using the Merchandise Mart building uh, as a canvas for, for video art and for uh, lighting art. Uh, as, as we can see other portions and rooms uh, uh, details and components of the Chicago River Walk. This is, this is again from the architectural boat tour. So you get to see the river and the river walk from an interesting uh, standpoint when you are uh, on the boat tour. Another project in Austria called Perspektenweg, or Path of Perspectives. Uh, this is by the Norwegian firm of Snohetta Architects. Uh, a firm that's, that's uh, winning several competitions now. They are doing. They do primarily museums, uh, large institutional buildings, art centers, and the like. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, their San Francisco Museum of Modern Art project, uh, which was an addition to their museum building. But they also have been contracted to do a new performing arts center at the World Trade Center site. Smaller project of theirs, but I think I think a very important one. This idea of Creating, uh, creating a promontory off of a hiking path overlooking uh, the city of Innsbruck, Austria. So this would be a few, few thousand meters up uh, from the city level, from the town level. Um, uh, an interesting addition to an existing hiking path. Uh, and so, as, as many Austrians do, uh, they will, um, they will take, take a funicular or a uh, uh, angled elevated rail car up the side of a mountain uh, or cable car, but in this case a funicular, which would be a, a, a cog railway or a, a climbing railway that takes folks up to the top of a hill. And then this uh, this project is is knitting together a series of very small moments uh, of a hiking trail that allows folks to walk down from the top of the mountain down to the city level. Uh, and and this um, this gives little moments uh, or details to pause, to reflect, to enjoy the view. To look over the landscape, and in, in, in the, in the, in exa another example of promontory, or, or these, uh, or examples of Belvedere, these notions of a portion of the architecture extending over the landscape. So, very uh, interesting collection of smaller moments or smaller spaces that uh, folks can either either just just use to enjoy the view, to gather, or to, in this case, uh, perform yoga at altitude. And other smaller sculptural details uh, involving text, involving corten steel, involving um, uh, connections between wood and stone and steel, um, other moments here that, that really start to uh, uh, inflict this notion of perspective. Another example of, of, of extending space into or over a body of water, this is Pier C Park in, in Hoboken, New Jersey, by Mac Michael Van Walkenberg Associates. Great la uh, landscape architecture firm uh, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, you may be, I'll be sharing with you uh, Mill Race Park from Columbus, Indiana, another example of their work uh, uh, closer to us here. Hoboken uh, is a city just across the Hudson River from Manhattan uh, uh, on the New Jersey side. And so uh, uh, very interesting city, uh, a very similar city, uh, higher density, very similar to, the, to many other spaces in New York. Uh, but but as, a, as a collection here uh, next to this wonderful park esplanade on the side of the Hudson River, Pier C was, uh, was a project that, that uh, attempted to uh, uh, create some more open space and recreational opportunities along uh, one of the original piers here in Hoboken. Next to it is a boat launch and amphitheater um, uh, in, named for Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was born and raised in Hoboken. Uh, and then connections back into the city grid here that make it make this particular park uh, very easy to access uh, through the existing streets and existing city grid. This is an example of a jetty. 
So a jetty is a structure that projects from land out into water. You may also refer more specifically to a walkway that sits in the center of an enclosed water body. The term derives from the French word jetty, or throne, signifying something thrown out. <laughs> so extending space over water, uh, we, we might associate this with a pier or a dock. Uh, all of it works, uh, but this is a great example of extending space out over water or into water. Here's, here's some of the drawings with some of the key elements. We've got fishing holes, fishing piers, dunes, folded benches, boardwalks, bridges, climbing towers, uh, some a great, really, really great playground, uh, lunch areas and things like that. All of this done with really um, heavy grade marine wood uh, in the form of a boardwalk. We've got a fishing hole right here. We've got a, a splash pad here. We've got a really great playground here. So good collection of citadel spaces, kid-friendly spaces, family-friendly spaces, uh, some mounded lawn, and um, uh, just a great collection here in this, this park. The other thing that's uh, probably most important is that is that it gives you this perfectly panoramic view of the Manhattan skyline. So, so it really is a very attractive place um, for families uh, at night, uh, kids of all ages, because uh, the uh, the storied <laughs> uh, skyline of New York City and Manhattan is, is laid out in front of you. So you can see Empire State Building over here, the playground with a slide, the play area overlooking the, the boardwalk, different play landscapes or exploratory landscapes where kids can, can sort of explore, almost feel like a forest explorer there. Not, lighting is interesting because it's primarily LED lamps built into the railing itself, so it only lights the walk, so it's a really great lighting detail. There are uh, other types of lighting, of course, as you can see here, these almost lightsaber kind of structures here, but uh, otherwise lighting is, is, is treated very, very succinctly in a very very intimately. It only lights the walk itself because the attention wants to be back onto the New York City skyline across the river. Portion of the pier here, believe it or not, I, this is something I was curious about. This points directly to the new Whitney Museum of American Art, which is a building by Renzo Piano, which also forms the southern terminus of the High Line Park, which is an elevated railway park uh, that runs through this portion, this western portion of Manhattan. So it's interesting, this pier lines up directly with that, that new museum by Renzo Piano. Looking back here, this is the, uh, the Frank Sinatra band shell uh, and boat launch and amphitheater. Views uh, from the Esplanade across this jetty looking towards the World Trade Center. This is the new World Trade Center site. So this is Freedom Tower, uh, World Trade Center 2, World Trade Center 3, uh, centered around around uh, the, the former World Trade Center site and the master plan. So watching that being under construction uh, with uh, this particular jetty here in the foreground. These are my photos from uh, July, or sorry, June of 2019. A little bit more of a cloudy overcast day, but still um, very attractive to uh, see the Manhattan City skyline. Looking here uh, across uh, the Frank Sinatra boat launch and amphitheater, this, this would be the new Hudson Yards project, which is a collection of skyscrapers by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, uh, rising up on the northern uh, terminus of the High Line Elevated Railway Park in western Manhattan. This is all, uh, this development here, many billions of dollars of, of new real estate uh, going up just west of Times Square. The fishing hole here, a safe place for folks to dip in a fishing rod and fish uh, directly uh, from the pier there. So a great place for kids and, and grandparents and folks to, uh, to do a little bit of fishing there on the Hudson. And then just places to get away. A little, little portion of the jetty here acts as a scenic pier. It just uh, allows people to get, get away from each other and take in the fresh air, take in the views, and uh, get some alone time. So. Nearby, this is a different project by architect Dimitri Sarantidis. Uh, this is the Hoboken 9-11 Memorial. Uh, a, a number of residents of Hoboken uh, did perish uh, on 9-11 uh, that, that fateful morning. And so this memorial is an interesting uh, uh, 
collection of steel and glass, which is lit up at night. Uh, all of the names are, are, kind of are, are, are etched into this uh, structural glass, uh, serving as a really somber memorial to uh, those residents of Hope, New Jersey that died on 9-11. Uh, they are lined up. It creates a line that takes, that, that if, if a line was struck on the map, would take us directly to the, to the uh, World Trade Center site across the river. More riverfront parks and features nearby in Cincinnati, Ohio. We have Sawyer Point State Park, Yatemans Cove, and Small Riverfront Park all together on the Ohio side of the Ohio River. This is the Kentucky side. This is Newport, Kentucky. This is Cincinnati, Ohio. This is where the Cincinnati Reds play at Great American Ballpark in, uh, on the former Riverfront Stadium site. But this is a collection of parks on the Ohio side that act both as levee wall and uh, flood control and uh, event space. We have pavilions, we have, uh, we have an amphitheater, we have uh, plug-in spaces where people can set up tents for temporary events. We have, a, we have an esplanade, we have a levee with seating, we have trees, we have concessionaires, restrooms. We have a fountain, a uh, splash pad and fountain. So a lot of interesting features built into this Ohio side of the Ohio River. This uh, aerial photograph shows it at flood stage. So the Ohio River is a little high this, at this moment, uh, but you can see how the levee wall is activated and how it performs uh, with high water. We call this, uh, those of us here in the Midwest, we call this the serpentine wall. Not sure why we call it the serpentine wall. It, it actually has a, has a formal name in the form of Yeatman's Cove Park. But uh, uh, it is an interesting piece of infrastructure that also acts as a uh, form of public art. Here is the fountain, which is quite popular in summer. Uh, th these photos were taken on probably the hottest day of the year. I don't know how we ended up uh, being in Cincinnati on the hottest day of the year, but uh, do know that this is quite popular in, uh, in the de deepest part of the hot summer. But uh, a well-loved, uh, well-celebrated uh, urban splash uh, pad and fountain here as part of this portion of the Cincinnati parks. This would be the Esplanade itself. Shade is always a nice thing on a hot Cincinnati day. Uh, and you can see views now of the different uh, Cincinnati bridges as well as the Ohio River. The Serpentine Wall, as I mentioned, is a levee wall. It is 100% uh, poured concrete levee wall, uh, but also acts as sitable space and as event space. And so you can see down here at the water level, uh, the water does rise uh, up and uh, really engages just the, uh, the river in an interesting way. A little map of the park itself. We've got the amphitheater, event lawn, other pavilions, restrooms, tennis courts, parking, uh, and other event spaces. So Cincinnati really does use its parks well, and uh, as well as well as uh, uh, takes the opportunity for a lot of different festivals throughout the year. This is a piece of public art. It's just called the Steamboats, uh, uh, Steamboat Memorial. So these are, these are tubes that, uh, that re are reminiscent of, of uh, stacks uh, on a steamboat where the steam would come out and, um, uh, as, as it powers uh, the boats along the river. Uh, this is a sonic piece of public art. So there are different speakers that have different sounds of, of steamboats, uh, bells and whistles, uh, and, and you get their sounds there. Statue honoring Cincinnatus who from Roman mythology um, uh, was given the gift of fire and so, uh, uh, and, and then handed over the power when he was finished, uh, sort of. Uh, so a, a, a Roman uh, mythical figure uh, for whom Cincinnati is named for. Another views of the levee wall and the river level at low, at low flood stage. But again, a really interesting piece of public art acting as infrastructure, or is it infrastructure acting as public art? The choice is yours. It's an interesting way that we can look at uh, a piece of infrastructure or civic engineering, and yet also have it be beautiful and have it work as a successful public space. The Purple People Bridge is a former freight rail bridge that connects Newport, Kentucky, and Cincinnati. Instead of, instead of destroying the bridge, they decommissioned it and made it pedestrian space. So a great connection uh, between the cities of Newport and Cincinnati 
Uh, there's also space for setting up uh, temporary event space uh, uh, vendors and uh, uh, food trucks and things like that. The Roebling Bridge was designed by Roebling. Uh, uh, his predecessor, if you will, the bridge that he did before designing and building the Brooklyn Bridge. So the Roebling Bridge is a wonderful bridge uh, uh, in Cincinnati uh, that acts also as a, a piece of uh, public art and infrastructure. Uh, this portion of the Riverfront Park is next to uh, Great American Ballpark. This is where the Reds play. Uh, some newer housing development going in here along what was for, formerly the Levy Wall and formerly Highway uh, uh, space. Small Riverfront Park is the latest addition to this portion of the river designed by Suzaki Associates um, uh, with collaboration with the local firm of KZF. Uh, integration of newer restaurants, pavilions, parking, so level, two levels of parking, as well as additional open space, event space, um, fountains, um, interesting parks and playgrounds, uh, uh, labyrinths and things, other features uh, integrated into this portion of the this is a good place to talk about Belvedere. A Belvedere is a structure cited to take advantage of a finer scenic view, either built in up part of a building or, or, um, or as its own thing. So, so these upper level viewing platforms here uh, act as Belvedere's because they allow us to overlook uh, a scenic landscape in this portion of the river. We can see how uh, this multi-level structure here as part of the park uh, uh, effectively connects the lower promenade here at, at, at river level with this upper level promenade with the splash pad. So this acts as a belvedere because it is a promenade that allows us to overlook onto a scenic landscape or a scenic river. But again, to pay attention to, uh, to this notion of water. So we have a splash pad here. We have fountains uh, uh, down, down into these different uh, little wave pools here. We have lighting that emerges with that. We have different colors of lights. So it makes for a very dramatic uh, riverfront experience here at night uh, in, down, in very close to downtown Cincinnati. Here's the view from the Belvedere looking back down towards Covington, Kentucky and Newport, Kentucky. Swings, people love swings. People of all ages love swings. This integration of a Celtic labyrinth as, as its own separate garden is another interesting garden feature on the Cincinnati Riverfront. You can see the parking structures right behind it uh, with the Belvedere overlooking it. So great collection of water features, landscape features uh, all along the Cincinnati Riverfront. But as I mentioned, the swings and the different seating, this, these shade uh, elements, really, really um, well-designed uh, compositions of tube steel, uh, painted tube steel that, uh, that create uh, very memorable uh, experiences for families kids of all ages here on the Cincinnati Riverfront. Other play structures, sort of play areas or play structures, splash pads, all effectively weaving together these, this, these different portions of the riverfront with uh, both the football stadium and the Great American Ballpark. Back to Indiana with Mill Race Park, Columbus, Indiana, a great collaboration between Michael Van Walkenberg Associates, uh, Landscape Architecture and out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Sadovich Architects out of San Francisco. Very, very close to downtown Columbus, Indiana. This is the Cummins Engine headquarters, uh, uh, Cummins Engine Parking. Downtown Columbus is, is, is two blocks away, and so uh, in terms of how downtown Columbus uh, descends down towards this, flat, this portion of the Driftwood River and the Flat Rock River, in southern Indiana, we have uh, a collection of, of bridges, of ponds, uh, and a large amphitheater on a mound, walking trails, other small pavilions and things, uh, just a, and, and a series of what I call, like to call outdoor rooms. So, so this park really evolved as a series of outdoor rooms, some wet or involving water or wetlands, some involving um, very clear geometries, some involving just event spaces, some involving uh, around, around this large amphitheater. And so this is a collection of landscapes, outdoor rooms, park facilities, and these interesting park pavilions, a uh, great partnership between uh, State of Architects and uh, Michael Van Walkenberg. Uh, mostly a collection of painted uh, red steel, uh, interesting 
notions of color theory here in terms of the red steel uh, contrasting against the green, the lush green uh, exterior spaces. Uh, park restrooms, a little fun fact here, a little fun detail. The M is for men and the W is for women, so, so the gender separated restrooms there, uh, reading in the landscape, uh, great collection of sort of tube steel structures, uh, shelters, outdoor picnic areas, grills, uh, tables uh, for families to grill out and enjoy portions of the park. Other pavilions uh, along the, the creek and along Imateur Pond. Uh, this really starts to um, remind me of Japanese architecture, Japanese landscape architecture, again, with the color contrast and with some of the, how the architectural elements come together, the glass block, the metal roofing, the tube steel, and the concrete coming together. This is a nice little uh, sort of uh, Belvedere. This is an example of Belvedere, where this is on, on par with a walking trail uh, onto the crest of this hill, and that descends into uh, a, a type of landing or amphitheater that overlooks the pond. Older photographs here taken by the architect uh, show, show how this uh, portion of the lawn was terraced just well to uh, create sort of a chaise lounge or a reclining chair uh, detail. Not easy to maintain, but uh, a very nice detail in terms of, of reclinable or leanable seats or uh, sitable space uh, along a waterway along with this uh, Belvedere overlooking that portion of the landscape. Another detail here, probably an example of jetty overlooking a, a portion of, a, of the park, actually very close to the creek. A larger amphitheater is also part of the park. It's a very popular band shell uh, for events in the summertime. And one of the more noticeable uh, landmarks in uh, this portion of the park, you can see here at the beginning of the slides, this, this climbing tower, this viewing tower, uh, gives, gives a full view of the Columbus skyline and, and uh, the, the urban, urban landscape. Uh, it creates this landmark here at the end of this portion of the street looking from downtown Columbus, framed by our infamous Cobra Head uh, lighting fixtures here. But uh, uh, this is an elevator and staircase that creates this uh, viewing platform or this viewing Belvedere uh, that gets, gives you a view of the entire Columbus uh, urban landscape. So a great collection of pavilions, structures uh, collected together in this portion of the park. We have the amphitheater, we have a series of outdoor rooms, we have the collection of the pavilions, uh, jetties, uh, Belvedere's, Some interesting drawings of those structures, plans and elevations, and the tower itself. Another uh, example from my work, uh, this is a, a urban park in Tanning, Pennsylvania. This is near Pittsburgh. Uh, initially done by uh, Quattrovazzi Associates of Landscape Architecture out of Pittsburgh, uh, but we had the opportunity following the impending removal of a dam uh, that where the existing park by La Quattrovazzi, which had some great, has some great features, restrooms, pavilions, an amphitheater. It's just, it's just that when we were looking at the opportunity for this for a dam to be removed, it meant that uh, this, the town would, would actually end up with a lot more riverfront than what it originally had. So, uh, so here are some views of the existing uh, riverfront. Nice riverfront promenade, uh, uh, pavilions and structures, lawns, uh, and flowers, and other landscape uh, elements, as well as that amphitheater. It's just that uh, once their dam was going to be removed, they were going to have an extra 30 feet or so of riverfront. So um, this study that I was uh, uh, contracted to do uh, would, would have taken a look at the existing park and look at opportunities for adding more space to it. Pennsylvanians love their boats and they love boat parties and so this is this is the riverfront park well used on an event um, using that particular uh, amphitheater. So so whole town likes to show up for their events but also hundreds of boats come from upstream and downstream to come visit uh, Katanning and uh, take part in their festivals along the river.
But what it meant, though, once the dam was removed, it meant an extra 25, 30, 35 feet of additional riverfront. So there's an opportunity to add on to uh, the existing riverfront park and add more elements, more features, more trails, um, more, more boat-friendly features, including a new launch, extensions of lawn, extensions of the amphitheater, extensions of of uh, uh, planting areas and flower areas. So, so, so a lot of new opportunities for this park to expand given that the additional riverfront was available following the, the removal of a dam. So these are sketches uh, primarily done with colored pencil directly on top of a printout uh, of the existing photographs. And then my final ink and color pencil and marker plan fully fully rendered and fully labeled. And then some high level views of the new extended uh, uh, spaces, trails, uh, planting areas, uh, pavilions. This is the existing in the background, but then a new pavilion uh, uh, added onto this along with a movable a floating dock. Extension or uh, additional space uh, uh, next to the existing amphitheater with perhaps a permanent band shell and, and, and again, another uh, movable floating dock. With uh, additional space come the opportunity for more additional amenities, maybe a small veterans memorial uh, or additional playgrounds or play areas. That is all. Thank you very much.